complicated lecture on uh, s democracy and resilience, I think I should say thank you for coming back, uh, first of all, especially since it's such a beautiful day here and you could be out you know, trekking in the mountains or something. So thank you for being here. Um, uh, Professor Belloni is not able to be here today, so I'm, uh, you, you're with me, which is great. Um, I uh, enjoy this uh, very much, visiting here. Today's topic is, uh, is really kind of right, uh, it's a bit different. I have I sort of wear more than one hat in terms of my academic career, uh, democracy, governance, elections, one part of it. Uh, but the other part is uh, this area of post-war peace building and how very much like uh, Professor Belloni uh, has worked on the Balkans, of course, and post-war uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, my research, I started out as a journalist, actually, working in South Africa uh, over 30 years ago, believe it or not. Uh, and um, uh, today, uh, one looks at a wide range of countries that have come out of conflict, uh, and the process of building peace in these countries is a challenge for, for people domestically and for outside actors who come in, mostly development agencies. So as the professor mentioned yesterday, I've done a lot of work in the past few years on this topic of social cohesion. And social cohesion is a term that has become very important among what we would call, you know, from kind of United Nations perspective, development partners. So development partners would be the UN agencies, the UN Development Program, but also those like UNICEF that work with children, uh, and uh, even those, uh, for example, this, this past few days I was in Geneva uh, at the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, and they work on social cohesion, integration of migrants, uh, integration of those who've been displaced from conflict uh, in, within their own countries, internally displaced persons, IDPs, et cetera. So this time social cohesion has uh, become the concept that is preferable for many peace builders to think about uh, how you kind of recover from a history of conflict, uh, how you build trust in society, right, uh, when there's been an absence of trust. And uh, so for me, this area of social cohesion, I find it absolutely fascinating. And it's related to conflict resilience. Huh? So the greater the degree of cohesion in society, and I'll be defining that for you, so in a, like an academic way here in just a little bit, meaning lots of big words, right? Um, I'll be defining social cohesion, but it's closely related to conflict prevention and to conflict resilience, right? The greater the degree of cohesion within society, uh, the, the less likelihood that people may turn to violence to resolve grievances. And the other thing I like about the social cohesion concept is that it really travels well, right? Any context you're in, whether you're on uh, you know, a, a flight uh, somewhere or you're in a social setting, I think people can feel almost intuitively the extent to which you can trust others. Is there trust in this community? Or do people live behind you know, high walls with broken glass on top and lots of private security, all of these kinds of things? So how cohesive uh, is a society is related very much to its ability to manage conflict and to prevent violence. So social cohesion is what uh, I'm uh, here to talk about today. And this is based on uh, both a research project in which I was involved, and I'll present some of the key findings from that, uh, and a book project, that's what academics do. We produce books and hope somebody reads them. Uh, but also, again, the work with the UN Development Program. The UN Development Program is in, uh, a present in about 120 countries around the world. And part of their mandate, of course, is, is for development. But what they've also seen is that a social cohesion facilitates development as well as facilitating peace. So we see the social cohesion concept very popular, for example, 
in uh, among development assistance providers, uh, development partners, uh, but also, uh, for example, at the World Bank, et cetera. Uh, so social cohesion and conflict uh, resilience is what the topic is for today and relating it to this uh, concept of peace building. So um, I was hoping for, I hope you guys can read this. Uh, it, it may be you have some binoculars or something you can, can read it. But this is just, again, just sort of like yesterday, right? Being a former jur journalist, I'm all about the news. I wake up in the morning, I read the news. I go to bed at night, I'm flipping, re reading the news through, through different things. And these are just some rip, uh, you know, different news stories that kind of capture this concept of social cohesion both in terms of when there is cohesion and maybe when there's less cohesion. And the first one is a good one uh, because it comes out of Colombia, a country, you know, which has had the longest running war in, in Latin America, 50 years of conflict uh, in Colombia. And you can see here that there's a football uh, a team and, and uh, for those who you can probably make out the Spanish here, uh, that this, uh, this football match is dedicated to peace in Colombia. So one of the things I'd like to highlight is the role here. Eventually, I'll get to my current interest and why I was in Geneva, which is on sport, the role of sport in peace building. Uh, so this is just one example very close to my heart of how Colombians are trying to recover from conflict, build cohesion uh, through sport. Um, but uh, also we can see that, well, you know, social cohesion is also affected by how much violence there is in society. So yesterday I mentioned the context of El Salvador, of Honduras, and Central America, where there's high degrees of what we call armed violence, right? Uh, um, the Mara gangs, the... Uh, uh, rates of, of murder and assassination and violence against women in countries of Central America is exceptionally high. This would include Mexico, which last year in Mexico there were t more than 28,000 murders. Okay, 28,000 in Mexico. Uh, and so I travel a lot to Mexico. We go there for vacation and have friends at uh, a uh, close friend of mine, a professor there in Mexico, and you can feel in Mexico the distrust in society, right? That people um, are not trusting of others because of this high rates of armed violence. And in fact, low social cohesion within these countries and the problem of violence is a pressure for migration, right? Often to, uh, to the United States, but to other countries as well. So armed violence undermines social cohesion. Uh, there's also contexts like Ethiopia, which has historically had uh, a history of identity-based conflict, right? We'd say ethnic conflict, identity-based conflict. And perhaps you've been following the news out of Ethiopia, but there's a new prime minister, young, younger uh, prime minister with a real um, has done work in conflict resolution and studied conflict resolution, uh, has a PhD in it, which is quite uh, interesting. Maybe all presidents should have a PhD in conflict resolution or prime ministers. Uh, but he's been, um, maybe you saw out of the uh, Rio Olympic Games, right? This fellow who won the, came in second in the marathon in Rio. And when he crossed the finish line, he makes this sort of salute, which you can see here in the picture which is um, a, a kind of a sign of um, solidarity with the Oromo peoples in Ethiopia that have um, claims of being historically discriminated against, right? So this is, again, kind of an example. Uh, he, the new prime minister is Oromo himself uh, and has been trying to sort of build more cohesion in society. Yet another context is out of Cameroon in West Africa, where there are conflicts over. Does anybody know what the conflict is about in Cameroon? You know, kind of how it's often described? It's, it's a language conflict. So between Francophone uh, Cameroonians who speak French, uh, 
and Anglophone Cameroonians who speak English. And some of the Anglophones want out and want to create their own separate country, et cetera, right? So we've seen that secessionism here. And the uh, 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 elections they had last year about this time were wrought with violence. And still today, you know, if we go to the UN or to the International Crisis Group in Brussels where they monitor all these different countries around the world that have potential for conflict, uh, Cameroon is very high up on the list of those that could slip into civil war, right? So this is, uh, again, an example of the problem of, of social cohesion. Since I mentioned yesterday the youth unemployment problem in South Africa, right, we we'll also see that um, there's a lot of, still a lot of issues around racism in South Africa and in schools. So I picked up this, uh, um, actually just published a couple of uh, uh, months ago, this uh, very interesting story out of a blog uh, site called The Conversation about South Africa and racism. And then yesterday, too, I mentioned the Uyghur minority issue in China. And here we see, again, a kind of a different model of what might be called social cohesion. That is the imposition right, of a, of a certain vision of what a cohesive society is on a very vulnerable minority, the Muslim minority in uh, far western China and Xinjiang. So these are just some of the examples of you know, social cohesion issues that we see in the news. Sometimes it's toward greater social cohesion. Sometimes it's away from social cohesion. So I'm like really fascinated. And I'm kind of, again, I mentioned yesterday, I'm kind of nerdy, this is true. But when I get it, you know, in any kind of social context that these days, because I study social cohesion, I try to think, you know, is there trust here? Um, are people willing to trust each other? Do they interact? Um, do they um, embrace diversity or do they fight diversity? You know, and so to me, there's different types of social cohesion and it's a big concept, uh, but it's a useful one. And very useful if you're thinking about, well, taking context like El Salvador and thinking what would it take to bring more social cohesion to El Salvador, which is a way the that uh, perhaps those uh, from the UN Development Program or others, uh, there's an organization called Interpeace, Interpeace, which is based in Switzerland, that is also doing kind of mediation uh, between the armed gangs in El Salvador. So they're trying to build social cohesion through programs and projects and other things. And these program and projects are what I'm about, like what works for external actors going into countries that are conflict affected, either like uh, post-war countries uh, like a Sierra Leone or a Bosnia, et cetera, or um, those with high degrees of interpersonal violence, right? How do you build cohesion in a context where there is a lot of distrust? So that's what we're about today. You're getting to know me, right? I'm going to start with the global context. <laughs> and we're going to look uh, in a moment just at the, um, what I think is, well, not just what I think, but what monitoring organizations would say is a worsening uh, context globally for ethnic conflict, right? Or for identity-based conflict. Now, I always put ethnic in quotation marks because you might go to a particular context and it may appear to be, you know, one group versus another group, Anglophone versus Francophone, but no groups are, are completely, um, uh, not everyone thinks the same. Often that the issues underlying these differences have more to do with inequality or for land or access to jobs or access to natural resources. So to presume everything is ethnic, I think, is, is a little bit of a fallacy, right? And indeed, ethnic, what is ethnic, we might think in some situations or contexts, uh, like in the contemporary uh, Middle East, in uh, Iraq, uh, for example, or even in Bahrain, they may be, or Northern Ireland, they may be sectarian or intra-religious conflicts, so conflicts within a religious tradition. 
as opposed to conflicts between religious traditions or between people of different faith. So worsening context of ethnic conflict with that uh, caveat uh -huh, that ethnic is a, a word that we should not use lightly, right? We should be very kind of empirical about uh, the, what are the nature of differences and not presume that just because uh, conflict groups uh, organize or mobilize on ethnicity that people can't live together because they are of different identities. So we're going to be cautious on that. Then I'm going to give you uh, um, or provide, hopefully, a nice, clear definition of what is a very slippery concept, right? Can I say that's slippery? You know what I mean? Hard to define. Social cohesion can be everything. If it's everything, it's nothing, right? So we're here in a sociology department. We want to be very clear about what's meant by this term, social cohesion. And then uh, out of some of our research, I'm going to talk about the factors that we believe are associated with social cohesion. And this would get at the sort of long question of historical narratives within a country or context. Who belongs? Who doesn't? Why, you know, what is the history of a trauma or the history of, you know, we would say every country or context has their own chosen traumas. Right, and that chosen traumas is a very common a term for those, for example, who look at Israeli-Palestinian relations, right? Each side could say, oh, well, we've been victimized in the past, right? And then what is this to create new, new inequalities, uh, new uh, areas of difference? And then I want to look at, well, what leads, what type of social cohesion, right? If we think about, well, social cohesion, it could be cohesion within a group, or it could be cohesion between or among elements in society. So we've got to be able to differentiate what type of social cohesion best contributes to peace. And I'm going to make the argument for what's called bridging civil society or bridging social cohesion. That is cohesion that is across differences within society. And these differences are typically language, identity, region, uh, but they can also be, um, uh, uh, there can be a gender dimension to them and other things. And then I want to look at, well, what are development actors out there do today? So if we were to drop into a context um, like one of my favorite countries, because I like mountains, that's why I like it here so much, Nepal, right? If we were to go to Nepal today and we go to Kathmandu and go around to say, well, what are the Swiss doing uh, to help uh, build social cohesion? What does the German aid agency to Gesellschaften Zusammenarbeit, right? What are they doing? What is the US agency doing? What is UN doing to try to build a more cohesive Nepal? Because I mentioned yesterday, Nepal had a civil war that moved toward democracy, but it's a highly stratified society. I think I can say stratified. It's a sociology department after all, right? We talk about stratification, inequality. Uh, so uh, what kinds of programs do they run? And are there risks associated with these programs? Are there challenges? And you know, is it just enough to try to build dialogue? Does that build social cohesion? Or if you have dialogue without addressing the underlying causes of distrust in society, you know, what's the benefit of dialogue? So what are the different approaches? And in that, um, I'm going to look at then how sport is used to promote social cohesion. And uh, if everything works right technologically, we'll just watch a really short video, too, on sport for peace building. I thought it might liven things up a little bit. And uh, when I teach a course, I teach a course on sport and international politics at home. Uh, and when I teach that course, uh, we just sit back and watch videos all day because it's really interesting. There's so much uh, available, you know, of different, uh, how different development actors are using uh, you know, typically football for peace, but they could also be using, for example, yoga to help uh, women in conflict-affected countries and men in conflict-affected countries sort of rediscover uh, a bit of, uh, of serenity in their own lives. So there's like a program, Yoga Air, that works with Rwandan women. Uh, there's the Afghan women's cycling team, right? It's very interesting. There's actually a very 
uh, interesting wheelchair basketball team uh, of women from Afghanistan. So you see how sport may be used for, um, for both personal resilience, but also community resilience, right? That's what we're looking at. Did anybody see the viral video on YouTube that went around yesterday uh, of the young Afghan boy who got, um, he was shot in the leg in a crossfire uh, in conflict in Afghanistan. He got his new prosthetic. Did you see that one? He was dancing, huh? It's really cute. It's gone all around. I flipped it to our daughter. But, you know, it's a good sense of, to think about, you know, how people recover, both personally, how they recover, but how do communities recover, how do countries recover, is social cohesion. And uh, so then we want to look at evaluating maybe what works and what doesn't. So my hope is that maybe out of this uh, class today, there'll be uh, some of you who will go into international development assistance. And, uh, you know, it's a very uh, important and meaningful line of work. And you may find yourself in a context like Nepal going, okay, I have a budget of uh, so many euros. Uh, how do I promote cohesion in this society? How do I even know where to start? What are the most important uh, issues to evaluate? What are the risks, right? What are the uh, potential benefits? And then I've got some conclusions about social cohesion uh, to put forward. And I'm gonna break like I did yesterday about part of the way through to um, questions and comments and that sort of thing. So I won't talk at you for two hours, although I'm fully capable of doing so, right? <laughs> Um, I'm academic, and my father was a minister, so I can talk for hours. Just ask my wife. And my okay. You can see it okay, I hope. Mm, only okay. So what this is is... Um, um, just again, the, the global context, and I'll put it out there um, uh, for you. And I think what I'll do is, for, with uh, Professor Belloni, I'll share with him both of these PowerPoints, right? So you can come back to it. And also, if you aren't sure you want the PowerPoint as well, just email me, right? So easy to find on email, ask all of the spammers. Um, so I believe we're in a period now in, um, that is very similar to the early 1990s in which there was a sharp rise in identity-based conflict, right? And as the Soviet Union broke up, and these countries, and well, you've done some look at the context like the Bosnia in 1991, 92, slips into conflict along identity lines. This new era of ethnic conflict globally, again, with the caveat about the ethnicity thing, um, is a, a good example is that uh, sectarianization uh, and I use the term sectarianization um, not because it's a big word and, it, you know, I'm an academic, I'm supposed to use big words. Uh, it's that my colleague uh, Nader Hashemi and another colleague Dan uh, Danny Postel uh, published a very interesting book and you could look it up for those who are interested in the Middle East uh, more broadly. And the title is Sectarianization, how the Shia Sunni differences in Pakistan in uh, Iraq, uh, through the Gulf region, uh, and even sectarian differences, say, within Egypt, for example, between the uh, 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 Muslim uh, majority and Coptic Christians, right? How this conflict has escalated uh, in, really in the last 10 years or so. So sectarianization in the Middle East and North Africa region. And then we see this directly from senior level uh, officials at the United Nations, right? Uh, uh, Zed uh, Al Hussein, the um, just previous uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations, right? The OHRHC, for those who know, it's O H C H R. It's a very difficult acronym. Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights sits in Geneva. Uh, today, it's uh, Madame uh, uh, Bachelet is the uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights. He's just the most recent. You can see his comment from 2006. 
nationalism and traditionalism to justify racism, xenophobia, sexism, homophobia, and other forms of discrimination. And so we get it right from the very top of the UN that the world is kind of going in the wrong direction on these issues. And these issues are about living together, right? They're about a global sense of social cohesion uh, as well as locally. But then I go again to these monitoring organizations. And the monitoring organization, I think, does uh, some of the best work on how many I, you know, types of conflicts are out there uh, that are along identity lines or have religion or region involved is the minority rights group. Minority rights group based in London. And uh, if you want to be depressed, you could read the Minority Rights Group People's Under Threat Report, right? Because they indicate these countries where minority rights and the rights uh, of uh, um, uh, those uh, who are, for example, indigenous peoples and others are most under threat, right? And so this is the sort of list of the worst of the worst. I read this horrible story yesterday about young Christian women in Pakistan uh, who are being sold uh, to Chinese businessmen um, a, as brides, right? And so this is that because they're minority and because they're vulnerable. So the vulnerable populations across many of these countries. There's a, a research project at, the, um, at ETH in Zurich uh, run by a colleague of mine, Lars Eric Siederman, goes around the world and looks at contexts where uh, there are uh, conflicts um, generated uh, by differences, especially within groups. It's got an unfortunate name. It's called the Ethnic Power Relations Index, right? Ethnic Power Relations Index. Um, but it, between that project and other projects, such as those uh, called the All Minorities at Risk Project, we see a th about 1,270, okay, give or take, more than 1,200. Um, contexts around the world of minority groups that are at risk. Uh, at risk, why? Because they're uh, minorities or because they face systematic discrimination or exclusion. And so this is the sort of global context uh, that we see from the monitoring organizations. And then back to the charts, right? Kind of like we uh, saw yesterday. This comes, by the way, from an organization called the Center for Systemic Peace. Uh, Center for Systemic Peace, and they also track, like they did yesterday, the number of democracies and autocracies, and we had that awful word, anocracy, which I hope you never use, um, right? Partial regimes. They're, so here they're tracking different types of conflict, and you can see here that the pink line, right, is, is with countries that fight each other, right? Like the old historical types of conflicts that we have seen. Maybe the most recent example of that is escalation between India and Pakistan along the line of control in Kashmir, right? So country A versus country B. That's a very rare event in the international system these days. I'm not sure if the laser is working on this. I'm afraid I'll turn it off if I try to use it. But you can see that this has gone to some near zero. But what hasn't gone to near zero, and in fact has increased, right, since somewhere around 2007, I'm going to say, 2007, 2008, those of us who kind of count up all the different types of conflicts around the world have seen an increase, right, in the number of uh, so-called the revolutionary war, that's the, um, the kind of, uh, um, I call it lime colored, but you know, what is that kind of, it's a bit like, uh, it's this color here. Uh -huh. um, but the blue line is the one that I'm most interested in. Well, this is their measure of so-called ethnic war. And so we can see that there's been an increase in these kinds of conflicts. Now, we could step back and ask ourselves, what's causing the increase? Right? Uh, that's a different lecture. It could be climate change. Um, I had a colleague at a conference that said, no, actually, it has more to do with the increased use of social media. 
because it's very easy to be extreme on social media. You don't have to actually face the other person, right? And so this is the kind of concern that we have, is that we see increased levels of conflict when, after the end of the Cold War, we started to see progress, right, toward, toward more peaceful societies, right? And yet this, is, this, this uh, a trend uh, has reversed as well. So I didn't come here to Trento to make you all depressed, but if you want it to be, there's some data to back it up. So this is part of the global context. Um, so why social cohesion, right? Why, why focus on social cohesion? And again, I've here gone to uh, Mr. Guterres, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations. And he says, look, when people clash, it's it's, it's not over civilization. So there's this, like, this book that came out quite a few years ago, The Clash of Civilizations. And it's like, well, no, it's not like we're revisiting the Crusades at this point. Uh, it's a much more different uh, in the 21st century. A little cloud makes it easier to see, I hope. Uh, rather, we're looking at competition over resources, at factors of discrimination, competition for jobs, and other types of grievances like being denied the ability to use your own language. So I was, uh, I, I read a, just one story this morning about public opinion in the United States. And it was a very distressing story because uh, the report was, this was again from Gallup, uh, the organization I mentioned yesterday that had the World Emotions Report. They said that 18% of citizens in the United States feel uncomfortable if they're in the, the grocery store in uh, co-op or um, I saw one here, which was a grocery store, if someone is speaking a different language than English. That 18% of people feel uncomfortable. And that may seem strange for someone in Europe where you hear all kinds of languages, you never, you know, it's just part of the course. But in, in, in this kind of context, it's often the grievance, you know, maybe more around language or other things. So identity is not the problem, it's often the effect, you know. Ethnic conflict is often the result of other kinds of conflicts. And here, we, I think Mr. Guterres has it about right. That as a result of migration, the kind of, uh, of 21st century uh, uh, issues of communication, all societies are becoming more multi-ethnic, and this is true in where I live in Denver. It's a hugely multi-ethnic society. Uh, we have um, people from all over the world. We have a huge uh, uh, Nepali population, for example, in Colorado. We have Somali, Sudanese. Uh, uh, of course, uh, a, th a good a third of the population um, is of Hispanic or Latino, Latino origin. Uh, and so, this diversity enriches us, but if we want diversity to be success, we have to invest in social cohesion, right? So this is from the very top, and the photos are just a bit, Mr. Guterres, you know, doing work with interfaith dialogue, or in this case, uh, you can't see it so well, but this is a UN vehicle in the back, and this is the UN promoting a dialogue across identity groups, particularly the Dinka and Nuer in southern Sudan, right? Southern Sudan, a country at conflict, uh, one of the worst in the world. There we go. So what is social cohesion? Well, it's a bit like the concept of quality. We all have a sense of what is quality to us, um, but it, how do you define quality, right? It's a very difficult work. There's actually a very good book on that um, called uh, um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Has anybody ever read that book? It's a fantastic little book, Zen and the Art of Motors, if you're ever interested in definition of quality. But I'm off track. We're back to social cohesion, not quality. Social cohesion is to the current sort of development practitioners, right? Again, think of yourself being in Nepal. You've got euros. You want to help Nepali society. Social cohesion is both something that you could evaluate in any country or context. How cohesive is the society? How much trust is there? 
uh, in society? How much do people interact? How much are organizations like civil society or the parliament reflective of the whole country? Or is there, again, high degree of exclusion, others? So that's one definition. Social cohesion is how much trust is out there. And I'll have a much more, um, uh, a fuller definition in just a moment, because I want to bring in economic dimensions, political dimensions, etc. But the other meaning is that social cohesion can be the outcome of development-based interventions, right? So um, some, some organization like the Asia Foundation, which does very good work in Nepal, right? They come in, they try to facilitate dialogue and other things, but what they'll say is that from our program or project, we have improved or increased social cohesion. So it has two meanings in contemporary practice. One meaning is the extent of trust in society, although I'll further unpack that definition for you in just a moment. The other meaning is that um, social cohesion is the outcome of development interventions, right? Or interventions by development and peace building organizations. And that would include uh, like the UN. So the concept, we're here in the sociology department, so why not mention Durkheim, right? I mean, here we are, we should. Um, that it has a lot to do with uh, social science theory. Remember Durkheim, you know, with some of his uh, early research was about wh why do people commit suicide? And this was in my early 20th century France. And so, well, why do people commit suicide? And one of the big findings was is that they're because they're isolated from social networks, right? So the idea of social capital and social cohesion is found very deep in some of this sociological uh, literature. But again, in, in recent years, right, so a good half of you are in the nation building and state building class, right? Is that right? Like just for some confirmation. That, um, in fact, yeah, that this is, again, development actors today who are doing state building to say, well, we could contribute to improving state capacity, the ability of the government to deliver services, to provide security, et cetera. But, you, but um, uh, for that to be successful, if you have a divided society, you'll have a divided state, right? So social cohesion works uh, for both peace building, state building, and it's very directly related to this notion of, of nation building, right? Um, and so uh, it's, uh, it's a kind of a term of art, and, and that's why we see it a lot right out of people like uh, Mr. Guterres, who've sort of adopted this as a way that the UN can talk about diversity in a way that speaks to all 192 countries around the world, right? All 192 members uh, of the United Nations. So social cohesion can be fostered um, in a way to, um, you know, how can you strengthen uh, foster is a, a kind of a different verb. I think strengthen is probably a good verb uh, for a social cohesion practice. How do you address problems of marginalization and exclusion in society? How do you increase social capital? Right now, social capital uh, comes out of the work of, well, Robert Putnam, whose work was on Italy, right? Some of his early work, uh, Putnam's work on social capital. And he distinguishes between different type of social capital. Social capital meaning trust, right? Meaning um, the willingness to interact, either in the marketplace or in the sports field or in, uh, uh, in a bar, right? You know, this is the kind of question. And he distinguishes between bonding, bridging, and linking social capital. So bonding social capital, or I use social cohesion almost interchangeably, Bonding is social cohesion within a group, right? Within a particular context or group, bonding is social cohesion. You might think of gang members, right? Like those Mara gangs in, uh, in El Salvador, um, that they have high degree of internal trust, uh, maybe. Um, but very little trust between gangs, right? So internal bonding social capital. Versus bridging social capital, which is social capital or trust across uh, lines of, of difference in society. Again, without prejudging what kind of difference. And then the last is linking, which is sort of associated with bridging. 
um, and uh, bo bonding and participation, etc. And I'll get to the formal state part in just a moment. So this is a definition that of social capital uh, that has uh, been, uh, uh, sorry, of social cohesion that's been developed uh, for for uh, UN actors. It's a property of society, and we look at sort of um, four, three different components. One is trust, which is an attitudinal measure, right? Trust is an attitude or sentiment uh -huh. um, versus interdependence, which means we need each other, right? Um, and the third would be uh, interpersonal interaction. So interpersonal interaction and economic interaction, these are more behavioral dimensions of social cohesion. So cohesive societies um, are essential for, um, for collective action, for, for working together in a way that leads to common uh, objectives or goals. And every society may have its own common objectives and goals, but generally, what do people want? They want security for themselves and their family right? They want prosperity or the uh, potential for prosperity and economic uh, development. And generally, they want happiness, right? I mean, these would be kind of, uh, that's very philosophical. What do people want uh, globally? But this is what we find. And then secondly, there's another aspect of social cohesion which we're going to bring in, which is the relationship between people and the government and people and the state, right? So do you trust the police? Do you trust the administrators? Are you willing to engage with them? Or are the police the enemy, et cetera? Now, I don't know if you've watched any of the video of the sort of uh, uh, demonstrations in Caracas in Venezuela, you know, where people are throwing rocks at the police and the police are shooting tear gas. It's not the first time we've seen that, right? So this question of the role of the state or government in promoting social cohesion or being a cohesive society is also critical. When you took a look at UNDP, UN Development Program, you know, when they're out working, again, 120 countries around the world, they're working uh, at a level to say, okay, we need this concept to relate to the agenda of the United Nations, peace and security, development, and human rights. And so for them, social cohesion uh, is not so much about that internal or bonding social cohesion, right, which we could associate with nationalism or regionalism or sectarianism, sort of us versus them, right? Think of Northern Ireland as an example. No, for the UN, social cohesion is about inclusivity. It's about notions of tolerance now, tolerance, we want to talk about a little bit, right? Because it's one thing just to tolerate other people in society who are different based on any kind of difference. Disability could be a difference, gender differences. It's one thing to tolerate others. Um, it's another to treat those uh, and to appreciate diversity uh, with uh, dignity and respect. So this is an important part of the UN definition on social cohesion that is given a multicultural world, it is an inclusive view, right? Because, well, we could talk about why that's the case. And they say social cohesion uh, um, uh, arises organically within society and can't be pushed on people. In other words, maybe the Chinese Communist Party has a vision of what is a cohesive Chinese society that does not include the, the Uyghur Muslims uh, as Muslims as such, and so they're trying to impose a vision of cohesion uh, on this society. So uh, this, this question of uh, social cohesion has to be voluntary, right? You can't be forced uh, to be a certain type of person, uh, at least from this view of the UN. So, this is, a, this is an unwieldy definition, agreed, social cohesion can be, it's complex, it's multidimensional, uh, it's context specific, you know what I mean by that, context specific, that means in a particular uh, environment at a local level, uh, a particular a setting, there could be more social cohesion or another, right? Um, 
So uh, we could think about how cohesion develops. It could be the sort of long history of how a country defines itself as multi-ethnic. Again, I was just in Switzerland and it's like, you know, it's, it's written into the DNA of Switzerland to be multilingual, right? And you go from one canton to the other and all the road signs change, everything changes, et cetera. Um, if I were a World Bank economist, which, which I'm not, and I would never pretend to be, but if I were, you could also have a completely economic point of view about social cohesion as well. It may be simply rational or functional, right, in terms of networks of interactions, economic exchanges, interdependencies, et cetera. So if anybody's interested in this sort of more political economy of social cohesion, I'll get, I'll get jargonistic on you, political economy of social cohesion. There's a very good work out of the World Bank, a 2013 book uh, on social dynamics and fragility that would look at the extent you know, and if you think about it more from the opposite side, if there's inequality, if there's high levels of poverty and exclusion, then the idea of being cohesive, uh, when some people live in big mansions, again, with like broken rocks, on, you know, bottles on top and big loud dogs that'll bite you and all that, and some people live in small shacks uh, just right next door, what kind of cohesion is that in society, right? They may interact economically, but more likely the person from the shanty town or, or the favela in a place like uh, Rio de Janeiro is working as a maid or a landscaper or a gardener in their home rather than really being, you know, sort of an equal basis of economic exchange. So, um, that's a, a little further on the definition. So now I'm going to get really academic on you to say, okay, now um, let's think about a really specific definition of social cohesion. And every academic presentation should have a two by two matrix, right? <laughs> at least in my experience. When we look at social cohesion, we say there are two dimensions and two components. Right? The dimensions are what we would first call the horizontal dimension of social cohesion. And the horizontal dimension, like horizontal this way, right? Horizontal. So horizontal dimension in social cohesion would be how people interact in society. Right? People to people relationships. Again, trust, interaction, understanding, uh, common, uh, goals, one of the sort of often one of the measures uh, of uh, vertical interaction of social cohesion, you can see it here on the, is trust um, and uh, including those from other social groups. So a sense of belonging or common destiny. Like, do we live together or not? That's the sort of core issue at the horizontal level. Then we might think about the vertical level. The vertical level, again, if you think about 1,200. Uh, a, a plus excluded groups around the world, the vertical dimension would be between the people and government. And this could be between people and the local government, or it could be people and a national government, et cetera. And the sort of vertical dimension is really about state society relationships, right? Is the state inclusive? Is it responsive to the needs of all people in society? Does the state itself promote an inclusive narrative, or does it define some people out of the inclusive narrative? And the, the example today would be the context of Myanmar, where the government of Myanmar defines the Rohingya Muslims as being outside of society. These are really Bengalis, they would like to say, right? That they don't even belong in this country. And as a, con as a consequence, right, there's been, you know, ethnic cleansing and genocidal uh, um, uh, abuses in Myanmar, right? According to whom? According to the United Nations, Human Rights Watch, all the major monitors. So then we could see this is the sort of vertical dimension. Um, and uh, a confidence in political and other racial institutions, trust in public figures, et cetera. And then we have the kind of components of social cohesion. So like I'm an academic, right? I'm gonna say like, okay, social cohesion, if, it, if I can't measure it, it doesn't exist. 
right? I'm an empiricist, right? So I'm going to be able to say, okay, how are we going to measure this? And I'll get back to some measuring uh, uh, indices and other things that measure it. But one is objective measures, right? How much, how many um, uh, uh, concrete actions of cooperation and participation in society. So if we see, for example, as I mentioned, very low youth participation in politics in a country like South Africa, it's because um, there's very little um, uh, cooperation and participation because there's no trust in the state, right? The state hasn't provided jobs, it hasn't provided security, et cetera. So there's a sense of alienation, alienation. Versus the subjective components, which is about beliefs and, and again, kind of more of a value orientation. And if we put this all together, we could see from, you know, vertical uh, and objective, and you could see uh, here some of the kind of common measures civil society, participation, absence of major intergroup cleavages. Uh, cleavages might be like back to that Cameroon example where their language is a strong differentiator in that context. So what are the common attributes of social cohesion? So I've got a friend uh, down in Cyprus. Has anybody been to Cyprus? The island of Cyprus, so close, beautiful beaches. Come on, Cyprus is a really nice country, but Cyprus has issues, huh? Does anybody know the main issue, the difference in society? Absolutely, right down the middle, well, not quite the middle, but a little further east is the so-called Green Line, which uh, goes back to the brief uh, civil war in 1974, but you have the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus and you have the Greek Cypriots. And they, they, it's the same country, right? But they live separately in two different uh, contexts. And so my colleague down there, um, uh, uh, Alexandra Lourdes, um, has developed, I think, one of the best measures, like attitudinal and behavioral measures based on an index, and it's called SCORE, the Social Cohesion and Reconciliation Index. You could look it up online. It's called SCORE for Peace. Don't do it now, but you can look at it. You can look at do it now if you want. Um, but uh, some of this draws on his good work about saying, okay, let's measure social cohesion in a particular context. So what are they going to measure? They're going to ask people, how much do you trust in each other? How much do you trust others in society? How much belonging is there? How many shared values? What are shared values in society? And what are different values within society? How much inclusion is there in economic, in social, and political life, right? So measuring the degree of inclusivity and exclusivity. Uh, and that's a very difficult thing to do um, methodologically, right? To think about, well, how do we measure the degree of inclusion even within a parliament or a cabinet or um, how inclusive is civil society? And then how much security is there, right? Personal security. Do, do women feel secure walking alone? Do, um, do people feel secure in neighborhoods uh, that maybe are um, inhabited by people of an other identity, right? Or another group or another, uh, even another social class, right? So this is their, their kind of typical terms. And then we could think about, oh, okay, well, wait a minute. There's also a lot of theory behind evaluating uh, uh, social cohesion. We could look at it from an anthropological, even a, a, a you know, sort of a, a sociological perspective about the origins of a particular nation or group and how uh, social cohesion has evolved. We could look at it from a human communication perspective, right, and monitor social media to see how much uh, um, sense of cooperation or not is there in uh, uh, society. Social psychology brings us all kinds of concepts like, like stigma, right? Do people, do people who have disabilities are they stigmatized within society, right? Are they, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, political science is about power and authority, political economy, and even environmentally, geospatially, we could look at social cohesion. 
So again, I don't know if you've seen the sort of pictures of South African neighborhoods, you know, that are taken with satellite images, where you can see the kind of clear line between what would be a sort of a middle class neighborhood or even a wealthy neighborhood and those who were living in informal settlements in slums and shanty towns. Uh, the, a lot of urban sociology, urban sociology, right, looks at this kind of geospatial differences within cities, you know, and issues of gentrification and other kinds of things, of policing in urban neighborhoods, environmental geospatial analysis. So um, if we were to flip the script a little bit, what are the uh, drivers uh, so what's the, what's the antonym? What's the opposite of cohesion? It's polarization, in my view, right? Uh, and polarization. We say, well, what causes uh, polarization within society? And there's a lot of big generalizations here. Each of these would need to be taken to a particular concept, a context, excuse me, and say, okay, well, what drives polarization in India? Or what drives polarization in Northern Ireland? Or what drives polarization in Bosnia, right? So these are generalized, but nonetheless, the first one is high degrees. Well, um, social polarization is a precursor to violence. I probably should have taken that out of the slide. That's a new research project I'm working on uh, where I'm working with some of our graduate students to develop them. I'll just say it, and, and if, it, if it doesn't register, we could, <laughs> we could talk about it afterwards. But basically what we're doing is developing a multidimensional index of social polarization. Uh, and we're going to take a longitudinal measure of polarization indices and then see if there is co-variation between polarization and election-related violence. So that was a big mouthful, wasn't it? That was a lot. Anyway, we look at social polarization as a precursor or as an, a, a step prior to when violence occurs. But where does polarization, uh, how do we get social polarization? When we have uh, negative stereotypes, uh, when there is uh, a narratives of exclusion, very much like the Rohingya narrative uh, that, that one might have, or today out of the United States, narrative that somehow, you know, that people coming across the border, uh, you know, are, um, uh, are, are going to engage in crime or, in, uh, you know, um, take your jobs kind of thing. This is a, a, a sort of a, a negative stereotype, but at least in the US context, I'll just speak to my own context, that many of those people who are demonizing migrants coming up from Central America maybe forget that it was just a generation or two ago that their parents showed up as migrants. Uh, you know, um, themselves. So there's often a lot of uh, 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 issues in the United States around, around these things. But to me, the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge to social cohesion is fear. It's fear of violence in society. And so that's why I'm so focused on contexts that have to do with post-war contexts like Afghanistan, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, even El Salvador, Colombia, et cetera, where there's still a high degree of fear in society because they're just coming out of civil war or violence. But the other context is like those in El Salvador or like those in contexts we see in uh, uh, maybe South Africa as well, where there's a high degree of interpersonal violence. And this would include criminal violence, right? And also gender-based violence. So in those contexts, we see very, very low social cohesion. So hypothesis, the greater the degree of, of fear of violence in society, the lower the social cohesion. Mm -hmm. So this is a particular problem. Inequalities and patterned discrimination. Right? So we're here in the sociology department. I'm going to throw my best jargon at you, okay? It's the notion of horizontal inequalities, overlap between identity and opportunity, economic opportunity. HIs, as they're called, horizontal inequalities, are absolutely measurable. There is a global uh, a monitoring project that looks at the extent of horizontal inequalities. This is out of the scholar Fran, Francis Stewart uh, at Oxford. 
And uh, her research would say that, look, where we see this patterned discrimination and exclusion, we see greater degrees of civil war and violence and higher levels of criminal activity. So uh, we had the nice question about social democracy yesterday as a sort of related, again, this idea of inequalities and pattern discrimination. That's why I'm so fascinated by Nepal, which has had this, this history of, along the Hindu caste system, right, in Nepal, of stratification in society, patterned inequality. And much of the challenge of contemporary Nepal is how to um, I'll use the big word remediate, or how to address these horizontal inequalities, right, in a way that doesn't um, make it seem like you're taking from one group and giving to another, right? So it's a very tricky kind of thing. It involves what? Improving access to education for marginalized groups, uh, providing greater employment opportunities, uh, local area development in marginalized or poor areas of the country and changes in attitudes and behavior, particularly for those who are on the sort of lowest rung of that caste system, the Dalits uh, community. Um, public policies of differential privilege and access. You know, I said I was a journalist, I started in South Africa, and maybe that's why I'm all you know, fascinated by this social cohesion stuff. But, uh, so, but uh, absolutely, public policies uh, during apartheid South Africa were all about in, um, providing opportunities to one community at the expense of the black majority. This has you know, been well documented in terms of the effect of apartheid. And apartheid only ended after that enterprise of you know providing of lifting up particularly Afrikaans speaking South Africans right who got jobs in the state who had access to education access to uh, livelihoods and, and farm subsidies and things like that it was only after that uh, apartheid uh, aim uh, was successful that apartheid kind of fell away right uh, and that's a sort of long story about South Africa but I'd be happy to, to help you with it um, other drivers of pol polarization, I would speak to this issue here, deep in the literature uh, of, uh, of political science particularly is the notion of the uh, a political entrepreneur or ethnic entrepreneur. And this is how I see Donald J. Trump, right? As the classic political entrepreneur who plays on people's fears, who demonizes others, in order to do what? In order to gain power, right? For his own greed, his own aggrandizement, his own ego, which is a capital E in the case of Donald Trump, right? The ego would not fit in this room. So this question of political entrepreneurship we see in many other contexts as well. Some have said that Nandra Modi of India may also be so-called ethnic entrepreneur. You, in your own experience, you could think about those that might fan the flames uh, of difference in society in, in their own self-interest in order to gain power or keep power. This is not a new phenomenon, the theories of the ethnic entrepreneur. The last, of course, is that once you have uh, once you've had a period of violence and insecurities, and of course, Professor Bologna, the you know, real specialist on Bosnia, once you've had that division, it's very hard to put things back together, right? This is the real challenge of post-war nation building in many contexts. And it's not just Bosnia, it's also Northern Ireland after the troubles. It's also the challenge today in contemporary Central African Republic for those who know that kind of context. So we might think about the different drivers of polarization as well as the uh, well, it's a very big word, the quotidian, it's like, it's in the everyday, right? If you're, um, if you're a minority or a person of color and you experience daily uh, microaggressions and daily experiences of, of uh, feeling like you don't belong or that you're not as good as other people, that this also undermines social cohesion, right? this sort of daily experience of interactions. I think I've got to be able to get it to this little computer, which is underneath the thing here. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, OK, so what are the factors? We talked about these here. There's a very similar 
uh, to uh, the last slide here. We could think about inequalities. This notion of relative deprivation and relative status deprivation is exactly what I was just trying to get at. So this is very good. This is a picture of the Mara gangs from El Salvador. Um, and then some of the work about um, trying to use sport uh, uh, for peace. We'll come back for that in just a moment. So this is a sort of summary findings here. Sorry, this is too, too much text for a PowerPoint slide, but again, I'll have this. You know, what are the sort of drivers, underlying drivers? Part of it's what we would call social dynamics. So social cohesion isn't a fixed thing, right? It can become more cohesive, less cohesive. And again, that's my research, that it becomes less cohesive around election moments, right? Can be more cohesive. It's often about land, language, and access to services. And this is based on like cross-national research. And that there's often this question of uh, myths and realities of inclusion. Uh, and this would include all kinds of uh, like uh, issues around um, just because a, a, a government cabinet may have a, a couple of members from a minority group in it, doesn't mean that those people actually represent the interests of that group, right? So distinguish between authentic uh, and um, uh, inauthentic uh, exclusion. So any comments on the context or definition, social cohesion, causes, differences, uh, dynamics, other things? I've heard if you wait long enough, somebody will eventually ask a question. Okay, maybe it's a, a bit too much. We'll come back to it. If you're interested in readings on social cohesion, right, um, just send me an email. I have a whole kind of bibliography on it. I'd be happy to pop it back to you. Also, a paper I wrote for UNDP, which hopefully has got, got most of these things in. But let's get to the good stuff, which is what do we do about social cohesion, right? When we have a cohesive society, a, a absence of cohesion in society that may lead to violent conflict, right? Like um, a persecution of, uh, of uh, Christian groups in Egypt or um, exclusion of indigenous groups in Guatemala. Uh, Etc. So, um, first is to some of the differentiation around bonding and bridging, and we're really looking at program interventions, right? That say, look, we want to build trust, we want to build networks of interaction, we want people to live together. Why do we want people to live together? Um, this is a really interesting question. Uh, from a UN perspective, right? Okay, so. It's, Say you're working at the UN. The idea of going around and taking existing countries and say, well, why can't we split them up, right? Why can't we just um, create more and more countries? We can always put more chairs in the General Assembly, right? What's the problem? And generally, there have been secessions and divisions, right? Czechoslovakia became the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic. And as long as these separations, as it were, are peaceful, then from a UN perspective, there and, and you know, peaceful and voluntary, there should be no problem. We can always put more people in, the, more teams in the Olympic Games, more chairs in the General Assembly, more flags. We can always create more flags, right? But the real problem is that these kind of separations, as we've seen in the context of Iraq or in the Kurdish uh, issue in Turkey, for example, they lead to civil war and violence. And there's also, I'll put it out there, a status quo bias um, in the UN system, right? That countries, um, including powerful countries like Russia, like China, like the United States, like France, like the United Kingdom, I just think the five per permanent representatives and the Sec Security Council, none of them want to see countries splitting up around the world because they have their own secessionist uh, concerns, right? And their own uh, histories uh, that prevent it. So what kind of approaches, both direct and indirect, uh, can lead to it. So this is, uh, again, um, uh, a lot of work. First of all, peace building is the answer, right? But peace building is a huge concept. 
And I don't know how much in this class you've looked at issues of peace building, but peace building, the whole term peace building has its origins in around, um, well, there's a disagreement among scholars, but generally I'll say it's 1992 when the erstwhile Secretary General Boutros, Boutros Ghali was on his way to the Rio conference in 1992 on environmental sustainment. And he says, well, you know, we have all these new conflicts that have emerged at the end of the Cold War. What can the UN do? It can prevent conflict, conflict prevention. It can make peace, called peacemaking, uh, like peace agreements. Uh, it can do peacekeeping. But what do we call it to kind of recover from conflict and address the root causes of violence, the root causes? And this is where the term, he says, let's call it peace building. Now, for those who may know, there was this uh, classic Norwegian scholar, Johan Galtung, who sort of was in part uh, developed this whole notion of positive peace and some mostly Norwegian scholars, who are all friends of mine, would say, no, no, it was really Galtung that invented the term. Um, but Butrus Butrus Ghali uh, owns it in terms of the origins within the UN system. You can find this in the 1992 uh, document called An Agenda for Peace. And we go to New York today, or we go to Geneva, and there's an office, a peacebuilding support office, and there's enough documents from the UN on peace building that have filled this room, right? And including scholarly work. So a lot of scholarly work on peace building uh, around the world. So what is it? First of all, it addresses security issues, humanitarian responses, mine action, like the uh, young uh, fellow from Afghanistan, he was shot, but not a landmine. But uh, for example, in Sierra Leone, you know the conflict in Sierra Leone, uh, there were all kinds of landmines, right? And so mine action and rehabilitation of landmine victims has been very, uh, a very uh, critical issue in Sierra Leone. In fact, there's a nice uh, documentary about a football team called uh, um, Leon Stars, Leon Stars. And it's about a football team of uh, ex-combatants and others who've suffered landmine and they've lost a limb and they play football on crutches. And uh, this is sometimes called the Amputee's Cup. Uh, and uh, it's a fantastic documentary. It's, uh, it's out of uh, Canada, a uh, Sierra Leonean uh, woman. And it follows this, uh, um, this fellow from having been involved in the conflict, he fought on the side of the government, not the RUF, and a victim of a landmine, he has post-traumatic stress disorder, and you know, he says, the only time I forget about the conflict and, and, and the crisis in my life, which is that he can't work, you know, because he's got this disability, um, is when he's playing sport. So reintegration of ex-combatants, right, is another example. There's the socioeconomic dimensions of peace building, about rebuilding infrastructure, food security, reintegration of IDPs and refugees. And there's a lot of that going on, of course, right now in Colombia uh, with, the, uh, with the FARC. Uh, and then there's like a national uh, political context. We could look at you know, elections in Sierra Leone, just to stay with that example. I have a very nice a student. She just finished her, her thesis, her undergraduate thesis. And she looked at the last four elections in Sierra Leone, uh, post-war elections, and say, you know, is, is Sierra Leone consolidating as a post-war democracy? We could think about human rights, about building institutions, about territorial settlements, like, you know, that uh, a Kurdistan regional government in Iraq, you know, giving some territorial uh, autonomy to groups, et cetera. And then the big challenges, the sort of psychology of peace building, which is around dialogue, grassroots dialogue, building bridges in civil society across groups, access to justice, a huge issue, and trauma and healing. These are all part of what we would call peace building. But peace building is a huge concept. Um, what does peace building look like in practice? Peace building in practice actually follows our vertical and horizontal dimensions of social cohesion. 
and that is that we can see that um, that there are, you know, I, I've done a lot with the UN Development Program, but also we could think of Swiss Development Cooperation Agency, uh, the uh, Swedish uh, International Development uh, Cooperation Agency, CEDA, and they all kind of, the Danes are very big in social cohesion, Danish uh, Danida, it's called. Um, but what do they do? They work on the vertical dimension, again, state society relations, citizen and government interactions to hold national dialogues, um, constitution making processes. Uh, they might um, support, for example, programs and projects to try to get the government to be more responsive, particularly around issues of job creation, healthcare delivery, maternal healthcare delivery, child care healthcare delivery, et cetera. So give people a reason to, to have trust in the government. Participatory decision making, uh, supporting parliaments and elections, dialogues among political parties, and starting to build up local gov government. So that's, that's the way peace building looks. And this is right, we're about state and nation building, and at least one class, this is the sort of core of state building, right? But what kind of state? Should the UN and others be promoting? Well, we would say it's a responsive state. It's an inclusive state. It's a resilient state. Um, and if you're interested in that, well, I would call it the RIR context, right? Um, I'd be happy to point you to some literature from uh, UNDP and others. Uh, Governance for Peace uh, would be the big uh, report from them. But then what about people to people stuff? People the people stuff is really about, first of all, promoting a culture of rights and of human rights, right? So the, um, the question of promoting human rights is not so much about saying, okay, here we are in the UN, I just showed up in Nepal, and I've got in my luggage here, I've got all these universal declarations of human rights, and I'm just gonna pass these all around and go, here you go, you've got your rights. Well, it doesn't work that way, right? Promoting rights is often about empowering those in society whose rights have been denied or who've been, uh, who've, who've been excluded or been marginalized for whatever reason, right? Uh, it's the true. Uh, um, critical to all this is gender equality and women's empowerment. And this is not just a normative consideration, you know, that there should be women's equality. There's a substantial amount of research, and I would point you to uh, the research of Valerie Hudson, among others, that societies that have a, um, a greater human security for women and girls are more peaceful societies. So there is an instrumental as well as a normative reason for the UN to be going in. It's not just because of the UN norms of the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women or in conflict-affected countries. If I said the 1325 agenda, does, any, does that ring a bell to anyone? 1325? Okay, five. Learning about the UN is like learning a foreign language. <laughs> it is. I call it UN speak. But basically, 1325 refers to a resolution of the Security Council, UN Security Council Resolution 1325, that calls for the participation of women uh, in post-conflict recovery, in peace building. And the whole 1325 agenda, um, you can find out a lot about from the organization UN Women, and then from uh, um, a kind of a uh, academic perspective, uh, colleagues like my next door neighbor at home, Marie Berry, she works on uh, uh, women's uh, uh, empowerment and women's participation in the countries that she's done work on, Nepal, uh, uh, Rwanda, Northern Ireland, Bosnia-Herzegovina. So her research too would show that, you know, the, it's not just a kind of uh, an add-on women's equality, but it's actually central if you think about the role of women in um, preventing violence in society, right? It's actually, women play really critical roles in various roles. It's hard to generalize across all contexts, but generally I would point you to the work of Marie and many others who work on this so-called Women, Peace and Security or uh, 1325 agenda, 
that um, there's a very critical or strategic win, uh, reason to focus on women's empowerment. Um, supporting incredible uh, internal mediaries. Who in society is the one who can bridge differences? So just to give you a little example, um, I was tracking the Syrian war, of course, a couple of years ago, and there was the potential for the Syrian conflict to spill over into the northern Lebanese town of Tripoli. Anybody been up there in northern Lebanon? It's a very tense place. And there are sectarian differences within Tripoli, right? Christian, Sunni Muslim, fewer Shia, Druze, others, et cetera. And so there was a real kind of uh, expectation that it was going to explode in Tripoli because of the spillover of the Syrian conflict. But it didn't happen. And part of the reason why is that there were very key individuals in society who had connections across these identity groups. And these identity groups, they are separated neighborhood by neighborhood in Tripoli, right? If you've ever been up there, if anybody's been up there, you've got Palestinians live here, Shia live here, Christians live in this area, they go to separate schools, they go to separate hospitals, they, have, they don't often work together even in the workplace. That's a classic divided society. So it's like, well, who in the community is the one who can say, look, if this thing starts to escalate, we'll be back just like we were in the Lebanese Civil War, right, which was a 17-year civil war. And so there are key individuals who have the ability, often religious leaders, but not always, right, sometimes teachers and teacher associations um, who know people from the other side who can be these, okay, we'll call them insider partials, right? They're not bridge builder, they're not completely uh, neutral, right? They're within a community, but they can connect to other communities. That's social cohesion. Uh, one example, working with youth, faith-based, uh, other uh, leaders. So, this is the kind of way that it works in practice, that if you're a development aid agency, you wanna promote social cohesion, you could consider direct approaches, like dialogue processes, uh, educational interventions to bring in to educational materials, uh, everyone's side of the story, right? So that people, young children can learn, you know, their, their different perspectives on history. Right, and in South Africa, for example, there's been a huge effort at curriculum reform because they've got to be able, in a sort of a, an interracial environment, to talk about apartheid and the history, right, from, from different perspectives because it's about inclusivity. So contributing to a historical uh, inclusive narrative may also be very kinds of symbolic actions, right, by political leaders to, uh, to, to uh, demonstrate inclusivity. Uh, and uh, there have been many political leaders who've been uh, quite, quite good at this in, in some ways. Um, what, what do development agencies often do? They love dialogues. And it's okay, there's nothing wrong with dialogue. I don't want to be cynical. But I was doing research one time in Nepal and um, we were asking people about their experiences with externally sponsored dialogues. And one fellow said, yeah, I've been to 69 dialogues, 60, 69, he kept track of them. And uh, you know, one week it's one done by the Swiss, and the next week it's some other dialogue done by the Asia Foundation, then NGO comes up, what do they wanna do dialogue? So in a lot of these countries where there's been efforts over years and years to try to build social cohesion, there's often what's called dialogue fatigue, basically. It's like, yeah, we've done the dialogue thing, but if there's dialogue without change in the actual you know, lived experience of people, dialogue gets to be pretty old, particularly if you're you know, kind of, uh, again, person from a marginalized community, right? How much dialogue without things actually changing on 
So there's also indirect approaches to promoting social cohesion. Uh, by the way, this is from Leon Stars. This is from the movie. I forgot I had a picture of it. And this is our protagonist in the movie here. Uh, so I could really highlight that. I don't know if I was teaching this class in the next session, we'd just uh, put all our laptops down and we'd watch a movie and it would be really, really useful. Uh, because it really gets at, you know, what does it mean to, to be a person who's suffered and who is marginalized because of having a disability, right? Um, and and uh, um, what does that mean uh, to be able to uh, participate in something like football and, and regain your dignity, right? Regain your sense of self-worth. You know, trouble feeding his family, you know, and that's a very difficult thing for a man in that sort of environment. So what are the indirect approaches? Well, the UN uh, has what it's called its armed violence reduction efforts. And this would be a place to try to address problems of criminality and of gangs, right? So this is what we would call the PVE agenda. Anybody familiar with that PVE? Preventing violent extremism. Preventing violent extremism, PVE, uh, and armed uh, violence reduction we could imagine in a place like Brazil, where there's been a lot of, well, there's a lot of armed violence, and you can see all, all around in the favelas and everything, armed violence reduction is a big program there, where they're trying to pro address the underlying causes of crime and criminality, and also giving people who've been in gangs and other things a pathway out, right? Uh, so cross-cutting civil society, two examples would be to support organizations. If you're thinking about what do people have in common, many people have a love of place. Um, even if they're from, they, they, they like where they're from, you know, and we see this everywhere. I love Colorado. If any, has anybody been to Colorado? Should I love Colorado? It's nice, huh? Yeah, we got skiing, we got deserts, mountain, but Colorado, it's nice, right? Blue sky every day, I promise. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, focusing on this idea that people love where they're from and environment, you can get people to work together on the basis of environmental issues, right? They have a common destiny, our common future, to quote the Brundtland Report. And then they try to address, you know, the underlying causes of, of discrimination, of marginalization by targeted programs, either to distressed areas, like in southeastern Iraq, for example. The UN has been running what's called the Local Area Development Program. So this is in a mostly Shia area in the Delta region, right, of the Tigris and Euphrates come down, and it's the so-called Marsh region in Iraq. And the Shia, up, you know, uh, opposed to Saddam Hussein, particularly after the first Gulf War, and they were brutally put down by the Hussein government. And uh, Saddam Hussein, in infinite wisdom, decided to drain the marshes where they had had their sort of traditional agriculture and other things. So the UN put together, you know, using UN Environment Program, uh, with uh, donor assistance, UNDP, they put together this program to develop this area to help food security, to help job creation, uh, and to kind of restore the traditional lifestyle. And this was all a project designed to uh, address the fact that Shia were systematically discriminated against during the Saddam Hussein period and that there needed to be some way to address this, this economic uh, marginalization. Um, okay, so I thought I would just take one example, right? One example of social cohesion programming that's very close to my heart, which is what's called the, uh, in, in the term, if I were to go to Geneva and be talking to my friends that work in these organizations, it would be called the SPD agenda. Sport for Peace and Development. And Sport for Peace and Development has got a number of organizations and associations with it. We could think of Peace Players International, um, Right to Play. Anybody familiar with Right to Play as an organization? It's founded by a Norwegian speed skater. It's actually based in uh, Toronto, Canada. It was just there. Toronto, that's okay. Um, but uh, um, right to play, they, this is their you know, kind of job as an NGO. They go into refugee camps, they go into informal settlements and places. They do things like uh, 
well, judo for peace, um, boxing for peace is actually a very interesting program. The organization Peace Players International, they use basketball uh, for peace building. And so this is the kind of uh, aims of uh, a sport for peace. One is that uh, sometimes even during a conflict context, they'll try to use sport to, um, to address uh, differences between communities. Now, I think this is challenging stuff, right? And sometimes you see it, you know, maybe um, back to my case of Lebanon. Uh, you know, in Lebanon, they have these 12 Palestinian refugee camps. And Palestinians are not citizens of Lebanon. And so there have been a lot of effort to try to organize football matches between the Palestinians living in the refugee camp and the local community. And this can happen during a conflict context. I have a question mark how uh, useful those are. The sport can be used for integrating refugees and migrants and IDPs. So you could think about a refugee camp uh, maybe in northern Kenya, right, with Sudanese, uh, South Sudanese refugees. And what do you do all day in a refugee camp? You just, there's nothing to do, right? There's no work, really. You're relying on the UN for food. And so sport has become a way to encourage healthy lifestyles, right? To encourage health, to try to um, assist with food security, but most importantly, to give dignity and a sense of worth to people. So sport has been very effective, I think, anyway. This is a book I'm working on now on sport and peace building. But basically, um, I think sport has been very, very helpful in terms of trying to normalize life for those whose lives have been interrupted by conflict, right? And I heard a very interesting story when I was in Geneva about use of sport for indigenous peoples uh, affected by the conflict in Colombia. Uh, so that one's one. I, uh, uh, one of my colleagues is going uh, for research there in a couple of weeks. Uh, and I'll be, uh, she'll be going to uh, Cart Cartagena uh, to uh, look at this program for indigenous uh, youth. Um, but basically, the idea is really related uh, in terms of sport for social cohesion uh, around uh, alternatives to insurgency, you know, to joining the militia, to joining the gangs, etc. I see sport um, as contribution to peace building uh, as a form of early childhood intervention. And I think it's absolutely critical. Um, although I would... Uh, uh, well, I'll just finish. The other a couple of things uh, that uh, sport can potentially do is just provide an arena for a community to sort of witness cooperation. So I was in Nepal about six months ago, and I went out with my friend Subindra Bhagati. Uh, he runs the Nepal Peace Building Initiative. And his organization has been organizing football matches between former members of the rebel forces, the Maoists, and the local police. And it's not about just the people who were playing each other. It's about demonstrating to that broad community that if these former fighters and the former police can get together, play sport, and shake hands at the end of it, hopefully they shake hands at the end of it, um, then it demonstrates for the entire community, you know, that there's the possibility of living together and of overcoming it. So these are some examples, and I'll send this around uh, via Professor Belloni so that you can see different examples of how sport is being used. Um, I'm watching my clock because I want to show a short video right before I end. Um, maybe it's even coming up. But uh, you can see how basketball is being used to bridge the divides between uh, Indian uh, South communities in South Africa of Indian origin uh, and uh, local African communities, but also between Somali migrants and locals. You know, South Africa's had problems of xenophobic uh, violence. Or you could go to the United States, where there is uh, out of uh, um, Fort, uh, Fortson High School, there is an all-Muslim American football team, 
And so football, American football, is kind of a nationalistic sport, right? And um, to have an all-Muslim football team playing another high school, because this is a small, well, this is a, actually a fairly large Muslim community in parts of Michigan, um, Somalis, uh, many other uh, Muslims there. And so to me, this demonstrates, you know, the ability of the United States to be multicultural, that this that this uh, a Muslim, a group of Muslim boys has not only sort of gone into sport, but they've gone into the most American of sports, right? American football, which I personally find a little bit boring, uh, but that's a different story. I'm more like cycling, skiing, rock climbing, that kind of stuff. Anyway, you could also look then at how UNICEF, UNICEF, the very first humanitarian UN agency, uh, created after World War II, right, to deal with the problem of displaced children in Europe, right? UNICEF um, is working with Syrian refugees in Jordan to build ties between Jordanians uh, and the Syrian refugee community. So what are the theories of change around sport? It's about building relationships. And then we're back to social cohesion, right? We've got our vertical, we've got our horizontal aspects. Um, it's about connecting individuals to communities. And this is kind of an interesting thing. Does sport actually displace violence, right? Does it provide an avenue? It's, like, it's not like social cohesion means that every society has to be a melting pot, right? Which is sometimes described in the United States, although the United States is not a melting pot. As if identity goes away, you know, no, no, no. It's more about displacing enmity across groups with a form of peaceful competition as opposed to uh, violent competition. You know George Orwell, the writer, 1984, all that, right? You probably had to read that at some point. Um, Orwell wrote an essay on sport in 1948, and he called it War Minus the Shooting. Which is okay, wouldn't we rather have, I mean, he was very critical of nationalistic tendencies in sport and said, oh, it makes things worse makes things, rather than make things better. So there was this, so the context for Orwell was this Russian um, a football team, the Moscow Dynamos, they're still a football team today. They came to Britain in 1948 and war-torn Britain and they played uh, these, quote, friendly matches. But what Orwell observed was how the fans reacted. You know, the fans were nationalistic and hurling names at, at, their, their, uh, at the others. And so he didn't think sport contributed to peace. Um, uh, he thought, if anything, it made things worse. Um, but actually, I think uh, we'd rather have displacement. He called it war minus the shooting, coined that term. Uh, but uh, um, it does uh, displace violence. And I think it's around creating space for dialogue and youth-based interventions, right? Because when we see contexts um, like maybe Northern Ireland or like Bosnia, right, where for, you know, the parents and older generations have been in conflict, but young people don't necessarily want to relive those old hatreds. Northern Ireland is still very uh, uh, divided, sectarian um, divisions. I mean, we had the a murder of the journalist there just two weeks ago, right? The young journalist and, and a lot of concern. But as a, as a youth-based intervention sport can help build peace. So I've got a couple of uh, additional ones here uh, to show um, that uh, when this uh, PowerPoint comes around to you, um, you can see, uh, watch some video on it. And you can see really even out of Northern Ireland some of the ways in which uh, this organization called the Legacy Trust has been trying to use sport in Northern Ireland to break down these divisions between, uh, you know, Republicans and nationalists, uh, between uh, 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 the different uh, communities there. Uh, working at the grassroots, uh, that often uh, sport is used uh, as a so-called conflict transformation approach. And the conflict transformation approach says that if you want to promote social cohesion, you can work at the top levels, at the elites, like have an interreligious dialogue, or you can work at the grassroots level. Um, 
or the mid-level. Uh, and so these are some of the approaches uh, that you've seen. I think many of them uh, that we've uh, already talked about. But uh, I'll throw up a video. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. If not, you'll be able to hear it. I've already got it loaded up. I looked around. I spent way too much time on YouTube looking for just the right video, right for a classroom context. But uh, let's take a look at this organization called Search for Common Ground. Search for Common Ground uh, is an organization uh, based in Washington, D.C., uh, originally founded uh, by John Marks and Susan Collin Marks. Um, Susan Collin Marks, her experience came out of South Africa, and they work around the world to support social cohesion, and they've been doing some work in sport uh, and peace building. Uh, so let's see, uh, technologically, if I can get this to play, it should be about With so much of the world in love with sports, we wanted to know, can sport be used to build peace? The Democratic Republic of Congo has witnessed much war and suffering over the past 20 years, with an estimated 5 million deaths related to the conflicts there since 1996. The town of Pinga in the DRC has been the site of horrific violence, with rebel groups and government forces clashing there as part of the country's ongoing civil war. So it's no surprise that tensions remain between the main groups in the small town in North Kivu. When global organizations search for common ground got to Pinga, the relationship between the Yanga and Hundi communities there was at a breaking point. Opening a direct dialogue about the conflict wasn't really an option for the ethnic groups in Pinga. So instead, Search for Common Ground arranged a soccer match. Even though it wasn't necessarily about conflict, it was about social cohesion. That was the initial communication and message. Organizer Rigobert Luhinzo said this game, and sport in a wider sense, has a major role to play in de-escalating tension and is an easy and inexpensive way of breaking down barriers. It's probably helpful in any environment, but in environments that are um, in conflict, uh, you, you know, we find this to be one of the, the only ways to get people to, to come together. Sport has been emerging as a powerful peace-building tool for some time. For example, did you know that a ping-pong tournament in 1971 is credited with breaking the diplomatic ice between the United States and China, leading to the restoration of full diplomatic relations? Africa on the Ball is another organization that realizes the value of sport in bringing divided communities together. Co-founder Andrew Jenkin says he saw an incredible example of this through his work at a school in Tanzania. Social divides were very obvious there, especially between Asian and African students. I think that's the really important thing is that, you know, it doesn't matter what background you're from, social class, um, you know, uh, status within society. With football, the rules are the same for each side and you're working together on the same team. And I think that's just a really key message. And because anyone can play sport anywhere around the world, it's a, it can be a really important mechanism for bringing people together. This is Brandon Richardson reporting for Peace News. So we can see, is that okay? You could see it, read it okay? <laughs> okay. Just one example, and again, we could go through, I mean, you could look on YouTube, put in sport and peace building, you get pages and pages of, of uh, different types of videos. Uh, Street World Football is one uh, out of South Africa, again, which is very nice, um, that uh, could be useful. Any comments or questions on the sort of practice aspect of this development actors and I've just got a few conclusions okay well I'll try to work through this quickly I'm always ambitious right like in the classroom so I always have more material than what you could possibly <laughs> absorb so this is a quickie. Um, I'll just say that uh, together with my colleague, uh, Fletcher Cox, who uh, uh, was one of my uh, doc doctoral students who worked with me, we did an eight country 
uh, set of case studies. Well, we got support from the Henry Luce Foundation in the United States, and then eventually uh, support from the Norwegian Foreign Ministry uh, as well to do some comparative research findings. And we were interested in um, how do external actors support social cohesion? So a lot of this has gone into it. But the first thing we've done, and this is the book, uh, sorry for the shameless promotion here, but this is uh, the, the book uh, that came out uh, from that project, uh, which is um, uh, from Paul Grave uh, Press. And you can see the countries that um, were involved here. What we did was put together teams of Western scholars together with local scholars. And we had an assessment template you know, where they had to go and say, what, are the, what is the nature of social cohesion or of difference within society? If you think about Nigeria, well, clearly it's, it's religious, it's regional, it's also socioeconomic class, it's linguistic. Nigeria's got more types of divisions than we can imagine in many ways. Kenya as well, Lebanon I've mentioned, the others I've mentioned, Sri Lanka where there was a horrific attack, was it two weeks ago uh, um, as well. And so you can see the methodology that we did. We paired local research teams with global scholars. We had a bunch of practitioners in on it. And you can uh, uh, see the kinds of uh, research that came out of it. We had very specific uh, findings. And this is all to say that I've been very general ab about what is social cohesion and what are some of the common principles. But when you really dig into the very specific country context, case context, even the city context, right, that, that it's, it varies a lot in terms of the kind of issues, the differences, the means of connection, the means of interaction, et cetera. So anyway, if any of you are interested in any of these uh, countries, you can see uh, some of the things that um, came out of it. There's a lot of issues, you know, so, so there's a problem on the sport for peace building issue. I just want, this is one of the findings from this research that I just wanted to highlight. And the problem is sometimes, uh, just to stick with the, um, the issue is how do you know that these things work, right? Are they sustainable? Do they have long-term effects on people? Or do these kids come and play together and they go back home to their settings and their contacts and their local environments? And this was like, yeah, we had a nice soccer match with them, but that's all it was, right? So there are problems here for monitoring and evaluation of these programs. How effective are they? When I'm in Geneva, I have interviews and some people would be like on one side of the equation, we have a little bit what we heard in the video. And I would call it sport evangelism. You know what evangelism is? Does that come across like almost a religious uh, a kind of uh, commitment to what sport can do? Whereas other peace builders are like, mm, it's probably not too harmful, but it doesn't have a lasting effect, right? And so a lot of the things that we're trying to do is to develop monitoring uh, and evaluation metrics to say, you know, if you have um, a one-shot peace building effort and you come and you get people together for one time, that it may not have a lasting effect, right? It's not a life-changing experience. But if you have a number of programs uh, and you work with individuals over time, you see what's called the ripple effect, right? A ripple effect, in other words, you get a magnifier effect. More and more people involved in these kinds of social cohesion activities. And it doesn't have to be sport, it can be culture. Often uh, with uh, women, for example, I have a colleague uh, and she does, um, she does work with textiles right, like clothing, purses, bags, other kinds of things with women in post-conflict environments, but she always brings together women across lines of division, and they work together on these handicrafts, and then they have a market together, and people come and buy them, right? And so there's, there are a lot of issues, but how do these things work? I, I'm kind of in between, right, between the sport evangelists or you know, those who think that peace building can solve the world's problems, and those who say, well, it's probably not harmful, but doesn't have a lasting effect. I think with appropriate program and project design and good monitoring uh, awareness of the risks, awareness of the, the challenges, well, at least one of the risks, 
right, that we've seen in this sort of peace building environment is that people come, they participate, um, they get all sort of excited. We can get over this conflict, this tension, this division in society. Maybe think about Israeli-Palestinian relationships, right? Where there have been lots of efforts to bring uh, young kids together in summer camps, right? And they come and bond. And every, every now and then there's like a Romeo and Juliet situation, right? And so um, what happens when they go back, you know, and their hopes are dashed and their disappointments or, or their big brother, you know, won't, won't allow them to see the other side again, right? So there's some risks in this kind of program. Programming, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to sort of identify those risks. So I'll, I'll finish up here. Some of my summary findings um, are that uh, international development actors, when they come into these kind of environments, what do they do? They look for the poor, the marginalized, again, those with disabilities, those with other life chances, you know, that have been compromised, and they seek to empower those groups. But then others in society may say, well, these donors, the Danes, the Swiss, the Swedes, the US, the Italians, they come in and all they do is support the other community. You know, so there has to, there's a bit of a dilemma here for outsiders. You go into a society, you have to be highly sensitive to the, to the concerns about maldistribution of development assistance, right? Uh, and, and this notion of empowerment. Uh, dialogues are fine, I'm all for dialogues, uh, but dialogues again, um, what is the lasting or sustaining impact? And so, and we found in our research across these eight countries and lots of other uh, kinds of research is that dialogue is useful, but it's not a panacea. I prefer, personally, and think are more effective are these indirect approaches. Indirect approaches to promoting social cohesion. So you don't go in as an outsider, development assistance, UN, and say, hey, we're here, we're gonna make you all cohesive, right? It just doesn't work that way. You wanna work on social cohesion, but you maybe don't wanna label your project or program social cohesion, right? You wanna be just a little smart about it. Um, there are a lot of efforts to put in things like peace committees, and I'm out of time for the lecture today, but if you're interested in this uh, so-called notion of, of peace committees, regional peace committees, local peace committees, national peace committees, there's a good literature on it as known uh, as architectures for peace, um, even though there are problems with it. Human rights-based approaches are useful. And again, it's not the outsiders coming in and saying, okay, here's the human rights, you all take them and run with them. No, this is about civic education. This is about educating people to know their rights and providing ways for people to pursue their rights uh, in a way that's nonviolent, right? Because a lot of violent challenges to the state are often about trying to, quote, claim rights. Complementary, uh, complementarity, I think. Oh, engaging the new internationalized uh, nature of religion. I just, yeah, I got a second or two because I'll, you guys will end at four, right? I hope so. Am I keeping you late? Cool. Um, that uh, the funding that we got for the project from the Henry Luz Foundation also had a strong component about how do you promote social cohesion in areas where there are religious differences. And what we found was that in many of these countries and contexts, uh, Tanzania, South Africa, Nepal, that our old understanding of, well, in Nepal, it's mostly about building bridges between Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims. Well, yeah, it is that, but today, um, there are all kinds of new and different types of re religious uh, activism, uh, Pentecostalist, evangelical uh, kinds of activity. So Pentecostalism is very uh, uh, um, widespread now in parts of the Americas, uh, in Southern Africa. So our, our kind of old ideas about religious peace building um, are, are different in today's world. Again, if you're interested in that, send me a note. I'll point you to some of this uh, literature on new approaches to religious peace building. And focusing on operational and structural prevention, I'll just hit that topic for a minute. What we mean by operational prevention is if you can build a network of people, 
in your social cohesion program, and then there's some crisis, a bit like my Tripoli example, then that's good operational prevention. You can mobilize those people to prevent the hotheads from getting things to be violent, right? Not reacting to, uh, to insults, not uh, retaliating if there's a violent event, that sort of thing. Versus structural prevention, which is addressing the root causes. So I just thought I'd throw that out there very quickly. And guidance for practice. This is more for like our development of practitioners. I mean, here at the UN, and say, look, you've got to work across all of these sectors um, simultaneously. My little peace building in a nutshell slide, the one that you couldn't read. Um, that one uh, is, is really about saying, you know, you can't just say, oh, well, we're going to work on reconciliation because reconciliation is also related to economic inequality, right? And how do you expect people to, quote, reconcile when there are really sharp divisions of inequality? Um, take a long-term perspective. If you're going to go into a context hold a dialogue, and then write your people back in the capital and say, we, we brought peace to this context because we held the dialogue. No. It's really a long-term, step-by-step initiative. And that's why I like the sport, because it, it works at a level of early childhood intervention. And it's about health. It's about safety and security. It's about fair play. Uh, and it's about a social identity. Yeah, social identity that I'm a kind of person uh, who um, appreciates everyone for who they are, right? So to me, this is something very important about sport. And the book that I'm writing, hopefully, well, I'm working on it. Hopefully it'll finish it, I think it's the thing to say. I'm working on it. It's just in Geneva, so I'm all jazzed about it. But basically it's to say, look, if you really want to build peace and social cohesion, it's a youth-based intervention. And not that the parents are hopeless. Maybe they are, I'm a parent, too. <laughs> you know, but really it's that next generation. And so that's why I like this sort of sport programming. I like the educational programming, and I like the environment programming. Uh, so, yeah, youth-centered and intergenerational. And then this is the last uh, conclusion, the last slide, and we are right on time, uh, which is that um, if you're talking social cohesion, social cohesion where there are cases of imminent threats to human security, the first thing that goes out the window is trust, right, and feeling together. No people... People barricade themselves, and if you've ever been to a country with very, very high levels of crime, the people live behind walls, they have private security, they have big mean dogs, right? And this is the sort of absence of social cohesion. So if you want cohesion, you need security. Uh, form, you can change the formal institutions, you can adopt a law like in, they did in Nepal that says that Nepal will no longer follow the Hindu caste system. You go to rural Nepal, the Hindu caste system is alive and well, right? So changing things formally um, can happen quickly. Changing things informally takes a long-term effort. So when I go to donors in Nepal, and I speak to the Swiss, and I speak to the Danes and others, I say, look, you need to have a long-term perspective, right? No one-year projects. These need to be very, very long investments. Descriptive inclusion is different than authentic inclusion. Addressing those horizontal inequalities. There is possible to say you can have direct social co cohesion programs if you can identify who are those that build bridges in society. Um, but uh, again, I go back to this issue of indirect approaches. You want to promote social cohesion in society. You really want to give people uh, an opportunity to discover uh, the reason to live together and their local context for living together. And this is done, you know, very often uh, by, uh, through education, through healthcare interventions, uh, and again through uh, environment, sport, the sort of things that matter to people in daily lives. And the biggest, I think, and I'll end on this note, the biggest, I think, is, is job creation and livelihoods. You know, because the, when people have jobs and livelihoods, um, this often then has a very, very strong effect over time. So addressing the problem of youth unemployment, 
globally, which is a crisis, a global crisis of youth unemployment, you probably know this as well better than I do, uh, that uh, this is in a way an indirect approach as well to promoting social cohesion. Well, thanks for your uh, very nice attention today. Thanks again, and uh, well, I'm all over the internet. All you have to do is Google me. You'll find this like 10-year-old picture because I haven't updated it in a long time because I want to still feel young. Um, but if you have any uh, interest or questions in this topic and you'd like to uh, send me a note, um, I'll pop you back whatever kind of information I can. And again, thanks for the good attention to us.